good morning uh, can i request dr som also to come please so uh, you know uh, taking the show forward uh, on the aster uh, brand value for now uh, skipping quickly from ovarian cancer to from endometrial cancer to ovarian cancer and uh, truly taking forward the ethos that if a medical oncologist goes for leave for 8 days he has to read for 8 days before doing it i was on a leave for 8 days and dr so made sure i i read for 8 days before i came for this but uh, all said and done uh, let's do a, a quick panel discussion on ovarian cancer uh, we all heard what dr v talwar said and um, his talk was quite clear in terms of the trials we have the guidelines we have and how to take it but how do we put it in day to day clinic for us and more importantly in in a setting wherein resources are are, are not that plenty in a resource challenge setting how do we put it for our patient so th- this is something which many of us would would uh, probably see in our clinic any day uh, a mid 50s lady uh, non specific complaints for 3 to 4 months a uh, reasonably fit no medical coma but days uh, somebody does a ultrasound abdomen outside and uh, um, uh, everybody knows this blood test called ca125 so everybody does this test so there is gross societies adnexal lesion ca125 665 so um, let's 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 probably start with uh, uh, dr som uh, sir biopsy in all or are you okay with cytology Uh, means all the patient who on imaging looks to be neoplastic and if my decision is surgery then i would not do any of them as right away go because in oncology there are places where you can operate definitely without biopsy one is ovarian then pancreatic renal now if my decision for whatever reason uh, patient factor tumor factor disease burden or i am not very sure whether it's ovarian or it's from gi uh, then i need uh, a proof uh, i always try you know prefer a biopsy Uh, but however if we don't have a omental disease because biopsy is not from a pelvic ovarian mass uh, even though it's advanced i don't like rupturing it if a omental or peritoneal ct guided or ultrasound core can be done that is my first preference it's unambiguous if i can't get in spite of whatever it is then cytology by centrifugation sediment cell block uh, is what i would prefer as a second option because reactive mesothelial cells and malignant cells is very difficult for people to do it i have burned my finger many time thinking it is ovarian ca they have given chemo not responded well then when i go back it is a primary from appendix or uh, stomach or uh, this one so biopsy if it is can be done from upper up done by i intervention radiologist if i can't get cytology is the only thing i prefer then cytology full aspiration centrifuge sediment cell block is what i prefer uh dr deepak dr ankur any 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 thoughts on this please very good that's the question in the young patient uh, abdominal pox is in uh, mean differential diagnosing routinely we do a cytology and biopsy before moving to even surgery whenever it is possible is that uh Uh, not 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 uh, not always because most of the time if there is a extensive cytology exercises and nodules before a definitive surgery i always do a staging laparoscopy uh, to know optimal site reduction can be achieved so there is a first trocar entry with 5 mm and that would uh, roughly give an option uh, i understand if the patient is saying there is a fertility issue then uh, i would do a staging laparoscopy biopsy frozen then proceed but they are very small uh, set of uh, patients actually uh- Dr. Jitender, uh, just you know, yeah, please. Means uh, in addition, um, we I personally do CA also, so CA one twenty five to CA. Oh yeah, yeah. Your... I mean, yeah, that that's a part of the this thing. So I mean, yeah, that's 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 definitely a part. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jitender, would you would you want to do? I mean, onco CTs are there, PET CTs are there. Uh, I'm sure in Jaipur, in place where where you practice, you you would have access to both. What are you okay with? What is your go to default imaging here? Uh, i am dr ankit sorry. sorry 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 dr ankit yes, yeah no okay so um, we are we are very comfortable with uh, ct scans uh, all uh, once we get a biopsy done then only we go ahead with the ct staging uh, pet ct routinely uh, we are not using it in our institute we are very comfortable with ct scans fantastic uh, sir i'm sorry i didn't catch your name uh, dr ankur dr ankur um, uh, any in thoughts on this yeah by default we do ct scan only for all the patients it is uh, abdominal and chest so in uh, so trying to take forward what dr vinay talwar said initially i mean we have moved to a era wherein we would want all of these three informations with a germline braca a somatic braca and a hrd uh, 
has anyone tried to do a hrd testing on a cytology cell block and uh, have have any of you felt that uh, no it's it's probably insufficient and i might need to go back in for a biopsy uh, sir yeah please dr somshekar yeah. yeah so um, yeah definitely um, in some most of the time i wait for the uh, surgical specimen to be available but uh, in my experience uh, in the limited times when i have tried it has failed more often in cell block So, HRD testing. so if you are going to wait till you get the surgical specimen in that interim first two three months of new agent chemotherapy, would you still do a blood uh, germline bracha? Yeah, I'll do. Okay, yeah. okay, great. See, uh, uh, the ideal scenario for us in a given woman uh, would be to do a somatic bracha first. Uh, that would encompass both germline bracha in that woman plus somatic. So, if you do just germline we pick up 15% if you do somatic we add 7% more if you do hrd we pick up 40% more but in india whether we like it or not germline is available across the counter lowest cost somatic doesn't do everybody uh, and even if you do somatic it is positive then germline required for the family to do it so uh, ideal sequence is somatic first and then uh, germline and then hrd Uh, hrd is such a very expensive and quality dependent test i would really like a tissue to be done and second thing is uh, if i am going to operate up front i get all this information after a specimen if i am going to give new adjuvant chemo for a chemo per se whether patient is germline somatic or hrd doesn't matter and all ovarian ca by law will need surgery after three still i will have a disease you know a tissue unless they are complete responders who are less than 11% but i would make an attempt that's why if we go back to my first thing i told you i prefer a omental or a peritoneal biopsy rather than cytology uh, very tough to do hrd and somatic by any lab based on cytology even though it is not that it cannot be done there was a paper from matata cancer hospital the incidence of able to retrieve somatic braca and hrd on cytology cell block and they were successful but it's uh, if i remember 40 to 45% was the incidence if you don't have anything you have, you end up with a complete response when you operate then go back and try to do with that <laughs> rather than not uh, but in ovarian ca complete response is like very very, very low for us bad for patient i think well, well put so, so to sort of briefly summarize this particular discussion uh, we cytology is more or less okay for us uh, in, in in our own resource constraint setting imaging wise is not too big a deal whatever we have access to is good enough for us uh in an ideal world uh, we would want hrd and uh, somatic braca also but definitely germline braca if you are just treating on a cytology um upfront surgery versus near joint so i think the master is here sir uh, briefly on that first of all it's a misnomer uh, just because we are surgically not trained we don't know how to do site reduction bad quality of surgery and uh, afraid to do a surgery we don't have expertise please don't send them to new adjuvant chemo there is no evidence today new adjuvant chemo is superior to upfront surgery i will put it this way medical oncologists love to put it the other way around that new adjuvant chemo surgery or surgery to her not change no it is not same i'll give you one example in all the trial three randomized control trial mrc trial scorpio trial then ignash uh, vargots uh, evrtc trial all the trials if you look back upfront when you operate the optimal site reduction rates were 30% we know that the only people who benefit survival benefit is where optimal site reduction now the moment you give new adjuvant chemo optimal site reduction rate as per the three randomized trial is 70 to 90% so here we have 30% optimal site reduction and survival chemo 90% optimal survival and what should be the survival should be better no it is same as this which means chemo and site reduction optimal is not same as upfront optimal site reduction the reason is you develop chemo resistant disease disease response instead of solid mass it makes a plug when you operate you under evaluate you think everything looks fine thbs so intracoagulant image for peritoneal stripping so inadequacy of surgery less radical surgery after chemo is a big evil on the patient if a patient performance status is good no extra abdominal disease is there you have an expertise training to do good peritonectomy upper abdomen surgery you must always operate having said that if the patient performance is poor or they are stage 4a plural cytology positive only they are still curative or there is a supraglottic node or inguinal still they are curative or performance of the patient is poor nutrition is very poor then only you send for nct but then do the same radical surgery what you would have done upfront this is very very important so 
I would not send any patient for NACT unless patient's factor are there. Or extra abdominal disease is there like mediastinal node, costophrenic node or this. No intra-abdominal factors is a limiting factor to me. Don't misuse NACT because of want of your skin. So I think that's a very fair point. So if we want to decide which patients needs uh, uh, neogen chemo, because let's let's all be clear, the, the, the most definitive uh, treatment in ovarian cancer has to be surgery. In India, quite a few patients end up coming late. They come with huge ascites and the ascites itself ends up making them a pure uh, ECA performance status. Uh, added to that, the poor nutrition, that sort of pushes them towards the urgent chemo. But then again, yeah, uh, the sequencing has to be a MDT call. Uh, coming back to my medical oncology colleagues, let's let's start with Dr. Ankit. Uh, Pakli Carbo, uh, near adjuvant, uh, what do you use? Weekly, three-weekly, why? Um, um, obviously more compatible with three weekly, but uh, patient related factors will obviously come into picture. Can uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. You said obviously three weekly. Uh, could you please I'm say okay. that? Uh, I'm okay. Only uh, if the patient's performance status is not good, I will go for three once a week. Otherwise, three weekly is uh, what I do. Talk deeper, yeah. So um, means the majority of the data is with three weekly Pakli Carbo. We know there is data for dose dense uh, Pakli Carbo. One of the Japanese trial has uh, shown. Uh, PFS benefit, but again, uh, there have been conflicting data. So mostly if patient performance status is good, we'll go with three weekly. Else, uh, if performance status is not good, uh, weekly Pakli Carbo is an option. Dr. Ankur, your take? I prefer three weekly. Only if patient with the poor performance status or poor nutrition, I'll start weekly because otherwise most of the studies favor a three weekly and weekly are equivalent. So interesting. So I will add a point from surgeon. See, uh, if you look back in advanced CA ovary, traditionally all the randomized control trial, the most important random is Scorpio trial. Uh, don't take the MRC trial, URTC trial and those because they were done in an era which is 10 years back uh, where the surgical technique was not evolved because most of the gynec units were obstetrics and gynec unit without gynec onco exposure and the quality of surgery was very poor. Today, if you are running a gynec onco unit, Unless you have a 76% optimal cytoreduction reduction in CA ovary, you're not a good setup. This is a standard benchmark as per the GCIC and uh, GOG. If you take 100 CA ovary stage 3C, 76% of the time, if your optimal site reduction is not there, you're not good. Those trials which were done in NACT versus surgery were in an era where 11 to 12% is optimal. But Scorpio trial is done in an era by Anna Fegotti's group or very good aggressive gynae oncosurgeon. And in that group, both the group 70% and above was the optimal site reduction. So if you look back that type of surgery in the history of the uh, ovarian cancer today, most of the patient biochemically fail by 9 to 14 months as per the trial and all the trial. And overall survival is 36 to 40 months. They're all non hypec trial. We'll leave the hypec separately. So which means this is what it is. So today in stage 3C, biomechanical fibro happens between 9 to 11 months by best surgery, best chemo. And then, you know, OS is 36 to 40 months. But in the history of ovarian cancer, human trial, there are only two trials which showed 100 months survival. 100, only two trials. Trial number one is a Deborah Armstrong trial where upfront surgery operated with IP chemo, not IPEC, IP chemo showed 100 months survival. Second one is a dose dense weekly packly by Japan. That dose dense weekly packly of Japan is not what we follow of dose dense. That's a very different regime. Interval also different, dose different. But unfortunately, that particular uh, is not replicated by anybody. So this is one of those conditions. Two more new trials now conclusively told both. Uh, but I personally believe because of some anti-angiogenic effect. In a young patient, good performance status, high volume of disease, if they can tolerate, you don't do any harm, even though it is not a level one evidence. Uh, we need more because there are the only two trials which showed 100 months. But today there is no level one evidence to give dose dense weekly packly as per the new trials. But having said that most of the medical onco institution would believe that if it is a high nodal burden, retroperitoneal disease is more young patient, no medical comorbidity, if they can tolerate, uh, still they put it in that. And I strongly believe in that because that helps us to follow the surgeon. And these uh, data were prior to PARP inhibitors. Actually, no, but, uh, but the thing is, uh, the PARP inhibitors help only 20 to 20 percent of the patient, and uh, most of them uh, has to be given for 12 months. Even after this, if you add PARP inhibitor, the OS would improve. See, what I would look at is the purpose of adjuvant and good surgery is the first biochemical failure and DFS. Now, currently, what happens is 
PARP inhibitor, I, in addition to this, will definitely add more and more. Uh, that, that's the same debate we have. Oh, why do you need to give HIPEC now? PARP inhibitors give. What is? Uh, why do you think that a good surgery and HIPEC plus PARP is better than normal surgery and IV chemo with PARP? Uh, they would add. That's how the science evolved. So, you know, you can't say that tomorrow there is one more molecule that will come and we can't say it is not done. Uh, but that's why, but having said that head upon head, it didn't help. So we can separate the PARP inhibitor group. Ultimately, 15, 20% of them will be benefited. Who knows in them with all this, it might be better. God knows. So I think GOG262 also uh, sort of uh, answered this question. Uh, uh, incidentally, in this trial, about 15% of the patients, so what this trial did show was weekly is equal to three weekly. In terms of the side effect profile, the neuropathy is worse in weekly. The anemia is probably worse in weekly, but however, the neutropenia rates are lesser in a weekly setting. So, the, I mean, if we can tease out patients as to whom to pick weekly, whom to pick three weekly, we, we can do that. But uh, uh, th th this was what uh, GOG262 said. If the patient and sometimes tire to CT, so wherever it is, for whatever reason, if they are not able to take bevacizumab at all, in such in that subgroup, weekly Pakli was associated with a longer PFS, which is about four months than uh, uh, Pakli administered every three weeks with a hazard of 0 0.6. And this is not something that we can ignore. Any thoughts yeah. on this? Yeah. So in, in terms of toxicity, there was a separate trial, uh, Mito uh, trial, Correct. where yeah. the dose of Pakli Texel was 60 milligram per meter. Square. Yes, yes, yes. So if toxicity is in concert, we can uh, use that. Yeah, we can use that regimen, exactly. Uh, coming to, so, so the Bevacizumab now, uh, Dr. Ankur, any any patient you have used neoadjuvant bevacizumab and any reason why you would even think of neoadjuvant bevacizumab? I personally don't prefer if I give a neoadjuvant chemotherapy to add bevacizumab just because of the concern with the surgery. Uh, uh, in, any of uh, Dr. Ankit, anything? No different. Sir, uh, uh, how long would you wait after if I have given your uh, bevacizumab for whatever reason? See, uh, two, three things. Uh, use of neoadjuvant uh, bevacizumab in an upfront, not recurrent. Uh, data is limited uh, in that particular area because uh, you must understand that bevacizumab is a static drug. Uh, it doesn't act on tumor per se. It cuts off the blood supply. So there is a sidal agent chemo need to act on that. But having said that, uh, patients in spite of two, two cycle of neoadjuvant chemo continue to have large volume of uh, serocell disease like pleural effusion Ascite and uh, pleural effusion. ascites yeah. as one set of group where it really still should be considered. Remember, because then anti they keep responding. I have a lot of such patients who are referred for HIPEC. Yes. C125 is coming down. Imaging-wise, uh, disease in the omentum is coming down, but ascites is increasing. There is one distinct set of patients. And most of the time, medical oncologists perceive increasing ascites in spite of morphological biochemical response as bad. And they keep giving chemo because in ovary, you can't give more than three chemo. Fourth, fifth, sixth chemo, survive, stop growing three if you don't operate by third, between third and fourth. Those are set of patients where the mechanism is different. There, one patient, I normally request medical onco to add bevacizumab to make the patient good. So remember why we started new adjuvant chemo, can't control ascites, cachexia, problem, tense abdomen, diaphragm gone up, liver gone up, breathless. And again, back to same for me to operate. I didn't touch you and patient of the team <laughs> pissed off with that. So those are selected group. I uh, request them to give new adjuvant bevacizumab. Drastically, ascites and plural involvement goes down and cachexia comes down, they're fit to take anesthesia and operate. And I don't want to drain the ascites with a pigtail. They'll have implantation here, there, everywhere. If they use bevacizumab, bevacizumab is a larger molecule, not easily excreted. It stays in the body for six to eight weeks. So I request them then to integrate it by about second. See, by second chemo, if ascites is not going, please introduce bevacizumab early so that the last dose can be without bevacizumab, so I can still operate at third week. Otherwise, even if you have used bevacizumab in the last, unfortunately, I had to wait six to eight weeks. And in ovarian cancer, there are two markers. Last, last new adjuvant chemo and surgery should be within three weeks. Surgery and first adjuvant should be within three weeks. If we miss these two, for every week delay of initiating treatment later, woman loses three months. So I have this in my mind. So we, it is where, where we have to sit with them and plan the bevacizumab properly so I can operate. But if bevacizumab is given six to eight weeks, I can't operate, which is sad. Uh, so going on to uh, adjuvant or maintenance bev in first time, I mean, this is also a very controversial topic, which with, with you know, we have trials. We have a US FDA approval, which says 15 weeks per day, every three weekly, that for whatever it is. But uh, 
in day to day practice uh, dr deepak uh, what dose of bev do you use and how long do you use in a maintenance first line setting so i use personally um, 10 mg per kg uh, any reason for that uh, means just uh, if we have two dose 7.5 and 15 uh, both uh, only in a subset have uh, shown advantage possibly in a stage 4 fair enough correct so, yeah yeah means there is no clear logic i am afraid to go till 15 mg per kg so 10 mg per kg we use it in other settings also and how how long do you use that uh, one year one year so, so one year from the start of your bev uh, one from year. one year post surgery from start of bev with concurrent chemotherapy and then and subsequent then, uh, okay surgery. all right uh, dr ankur uh, uh, what is your practice yeah i routinely i do 7.5 mg per kg because the results are more or less similar and why to give a higher dose so i prefer to give 7.5 and usually the same 15 cycles total i will confirm uh, dr ankit uh, anything different no nothing i follow icon 7 um, basically no specific reason just cost effectiveness low dose nothing else for uh, from point of uh, gyni onko i'll add something about bevacizumab if you have done a optimal site reduction bev will not add anything no os benefit only pfs so uh, if you are not able to achieve optimal site reduction it's your moral obligation to inform your medical oncologist in spite of your best effort you are not able to achieve it then they have to have bev because then we have os benefit in that group remember the only two place bev has in ovary benefit one is platinum resistant ca ovary recurrent and then adjuvant non optimally site reduce very very important number one number two if you don't follow ip chemo or hypec bev really helps in that group because if you see there are seven randomized control trial of intrapetal chemo with surgery in uh, ovary with iv chemo and all out six short survival benefit with intraperitoneal except one which is the recent gog their bev compensated for ip so if you are a institution you don't follow hypec or bev or ip chemo please also think of bev so bev would be useful number one if you had zero cell disease you know aside is pleural effusion number two you are not able to optimally site reduce and number three if you are not integrating some of ip therapy bev should be liberally used otherwise in all other case it is not going to help second thing bev helps only to compensate bad surgery but that is totally different than the parp inhibitor if you see the uh, you know uh, solo trial uh, even if you have done optimal site reduction parp inhibitor benefits maximum in that group that's why the proof of putting is that a parp inhibitor by independently give os benefit bev will not give independent os benefit it acts through a bad surgery you have to understand as a surgeon very very clearly second if that patient is braca mutated as per the ov hypec trial they would not benefit with hypex so i know up front if they are braca mutated then i'll do a good surgery let them give chemo and then follow it up with maintenance uh, parp so as a surgeon we need to read this to help them that's a brilliant point you know that's a big reason why we need to do germline braca even if you have not done at if you have just done the cytology it is important to have a germline braca because that will help us decide whether hypex is needed or not um in the interest of time uh, uh, moving on to the uh, i mean dr vinith did uh, touch on this talk but uh, some practical day to day points uh, from our medical oncologists over here uh, dr ankit let's start with you uh, sir uh, patient is hrd positive uh, would you which of these would you choose um i am uh, with olaparib alone i usually don't practice olaparib with bevacizumab uh, no specific reason but uh, uh, in my day to day practice olaparib alone is what i follow as maintenance uh, dr deepak your thoughts on this so hrd positive braca ne- uh, negative i'll use uh, rucaparib means we don't have uh, data uh, for uh, hrd positive braca negative with olaparib alone fantastic so that's the point which i want to discuss so what dose of rucaparib do you use it's a terrible drug to use uh, i have used so I'm, it's a terrible drug to use so what dose do you use see uh, means prior uh, means rucaparib off late uh, became available 6 to 8 months but i am using 600 mg but uh, somehow uh, 300 twice daily is the dose which a patient is able to take so that is literally half the recommended dose half the recommended dose dr ankur your thoughts on this i agree with that rucaparib is not that easy to tolerate i think almost half the patients i had to reduce dose because of significant anemia and gi toxicity so if uh, me the option would be either olaparib plus bev or rucaparib i will not use olaparib particularly in this indication 
I I, I think see uh, the uh, so with with due respect to my colleagues, a point which I would like to make over here is that first line therapies. uh doing off protocol treatment is still a little difficult for us so we are, at least i prime i personally would strictly go by the paola and the indication approval here so olaparib with bev is sometimes i would use uh, a, a problem which i have faced of olaparib plus bev is anemia and fatigue uh, they sort of so, so you give the olaparib dose that leads on to anemia and bev has its fatigue along with it so you put both of them together 2 plus 2 becomes 5 so that that is a problem which couple of my patients do sort of are sort of struggling with but still olaparib alone in hrd mutant but uh, braca negative i i am still a little skeptical on that because uh, the the reason to use bev is completely different than the use and to your reason to use uh, a parp inhibitor so i think there is uh, more to be teased out in the data over there uh, coming to the athena mono i know dr vinay did touch upon this but the 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 important thing in this trial and this probably the reason why uh, you know us fda still not approved is that about 50% of the patients on the athena mono needed a dose reduction and about 10 12% had discontinuation uh, mind you these are all first line treatment patients they have just gone through a, a whole load of treatment 6 months of treatment with us and then again they keep coming back with complaints uh, patients will not be happy and patients are happy doctor said to lose patient so uh, uh, that's that's probably a big reason why i won't do that uh, quickly moving on i think i have 3 minutes I'll, I'll skip through certain things uh, dr somshekar sir uh, this this is one thing which i want to ask would you any reason to do ngs in uh, ovarian cancer have you sent or would you ever consider sending ngs testing for ovarian cancer uh normally usually in the recurrent or metastatic uh up sir front. why sir i mean um, uh, because see all our information that we want hrd is either going to give us or uh, braca is going to give us. In, anything extra that uh, we would be looking for from ngs uh see sometime if they are behaving like uh, platinum refractory or resistant some alternate pathway actually opens up you know to know uh, can lenvotini be used or some uh, some odd molecule uh, really throws up in them and then it would really sometime helps us to know conventional treatment because by first line second line 70% of them should respond and if it is not there i would really i'm worried i'm missing something and then i recommend repeat biopsy to uh, rule out appendicular or gi or pseudo mixans component or uh, some other mutation pathway beyond hrd which might be beneficial for us to treat uh, uh, any of you dr deepak anything any your thoughts on this so i means um, not nga msi i like to do particularly for an endometrioid histology of ovarian cancer we uh, know that these patients may have uh, okay. a possibility of adding immunotherapy in a relapse setting that's a, probably the only indication where immunotherapy was otherwise all immunotherapy trials in ovarian cancer have failed to date yes dr ankur you want to say something would be a good option for non serious like low grade serious or endometrial they have some alternate pathway like kras or nol there is some data regarding use of mec inhibitor so there might be option a patient who has received one or two lines of therapy but not for a purely high grade serious carcinoma dr ankit uh, what is your go to drug in uh, platinum refractory ovarian cancer strictly less than 4 months of pfs um i usually prefer liposomal doxorubicin single agent yes yes single agent. any 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 other i will add uh, bev in this uh, bevesizumab if yeah so lipodox bev would be your go to yeah, yeah. anybody wants to you know, has tried trabectidine or uh, no, it's not uh, means platinum sensitive is the setting where we go for trabectidine uh, okay um, dr ankur your 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 take i personally don't prefer trabectidine i think it's a little more more toxic drug compared to lipo so giving it 24 hours is a big big pain yes, yeah i have very terrible experience of using trabectidine so i prefer liposomal Sir, anything you want to say on this? I I I agree. I would look at it. See, uh, recurrent platinum. I would decide. Am I ever going to do secondary site reduction? Secondary site reduction is limited to platinum sensitive or six months to twelve months. So I would uh, look at whether I'm going to add on experimental basis pipac to that patient or not. Uh, then quite often, if I want a rapid response, uh, I request my medical oncologist to consider Gemox regime. Uh, so that uh, patient drastically improved there is no os benefit at that moment os benefit in platinum resistant is only through bev no trials in between all of them has shown then toxicity profile that's one set if a patient is young still well preserved abdominal disease only uh, then i would request them to give gemox so i can decide whether i can do pipac or some intraperitoneal therapy otherwise pretty much between all of them there is no other thing as long as you can add bev but we know that it's very important to understand currently today Uh, i am a part of a i am a pi for a study globally with uh, 
Anna Figotti and uh, the whole group across the world for platinum resistant. Today, platinum resistant CA ovary uh, median survival is 11 months. Remember this with MEVA rotator it is. By 11 months, most are dead. By 15 months, nobody would be seeing it. Uh, we have enrolled them into a trial with Netherlands uh, called PIPAC trial where the survival went to 23 months. So uh, it's very important that if they fulfill PIPAC, I request Jamox. Otherwise, pretty much doesn't matter what they do. So um, I had a lot of lots more to discuss, but in the interest of time, I'll just close. So this is fresh of the press. Yes, ma'am, please. Yeah, it was a wonderful uh, panel, Dr. Som Shekhar. We, uh, we all know your surgical expertise and I have personally witnessed it. Lots of high pack and whatnot. As far as you uh, said, your preference was for surgery for all cases for upfront surgery for CA ovary in the primary setting. So uh, I would just like to know your experience about the survival benefit. Have you actually studied upfront NSCT and uh, upfront primary cytoreduction and seen the difference in both? Because based on performance Actually, status. Actually, you, you have not read my papers. I have published 150 papers in CA ovary. Yes, if you Google, I know that. If you Google in my name today in PubMed, 300 papers are there international. Of them, 160 are dedicated to ovary. Just this year, uh, in June, July, uh, we presented a podium presentation of Indian uh, HIPEC registry data for ovarian cancer. I'm a custodian of Indian HIPEC registry in India. 23 center, 2010 patients of CA ovary with HIPEC done in India, followed for five years. You can take your mobile Google, Trosom Shaker, HIPEC, ovary, ASCO, JCO paper, it is available. We looked at uh, women in India, in India, not my center alone. People say, you know, I have 91% cytoreductive mortality, less than 1%. I do two HIPEC a week because I have patient referred across the world. So 110 HIPEC a year I do. Uh, so they say, oh, only in your center it can happen. Every gadget is there I have. Uh, now, in this HIPEC registry, 23 centers in India, including AIMS, Tata, government setup, kit by. So, which means patient with low socioeconomic strata working in a government sector where ICU mechanism may not be good with various expertise skill. In this paper, which we published, also we presented it in IGCS uh, meet, uh, you know, in New York. We found that in Indian patient, if upfront cytoreduction optimal could be done in state 3C, and HIPEC, they had a better overall survival than neoadjuvant chemo interval cytoreduction. You can read that paper, it is available. It has been quoted after that in multiple publications. Based on this publication, I was invited by Vandriel to be part of OV HIPEC 2 trial. I am the only center in entire Asia invited. So, in Indian data, we have upfront if optimal cytoreduction can be done, the survival of that was superior than interval with no difference in mortality. But morbidity rose, stoma rate still 2.8% only in spite of bowel resection. You can read that the paper is there. Definitely, in I don't deny that. But yes, every center doesn't have that kind of surgical but this expertise. This is the registry. Center. Registry is from 23 centers in India where half of them are government setups. That's why yes. I, I was I was afraid that mortality may be 5%, morbidity may be 30%, bowel resection and stoma may be uh, very high, leak rate may be high. See, ultimately, mortality rate today in ovarian cancer should be less than 2% worldwide. If you do high pack less than 4 as per the French trial. In Indian registry, it is 2.8%. So, mortality is no different in India in spite of upfront. Number two, the leak rates is still 4%, stoma rate is 2.8%. So, that also we answered. We also looked at aggressive such surgery and first chemo to the medical onco, what was the delay? Uh, because we have a Japanese trial where three weeks uh, delay should not happen. 98% of the patients actually went for uh, first adjuvant chemo within three weeks. These four parameters I looked, then OS and DFS is different. You can read that it is yeah, there. Definitely. So R0 must have been a... Yeah, yeah. C0, if case. we can't achieve, nobody is alive. No, yes, no so benefit. So that's the activity. But it's a very good paper. Uh, read that. It is available uh, uh, cancer registry from India. Uh, last thing, very last thing here. This is fresh off the press. Because of my holiday and my info's reading by Dr. Som, I had to read this a couple of days back. This came in JCO this week. So interestingly, PARP inhibitors, the, the enthusiasm in them is actually going. So ASCO came up with a guideline rapid recommendation update. In this, if you see, 
Barb had a recommendation so for uh, platinum sensitive ovary, uh, BRCA wild type, HRD wild type, that is going to go and uh, recurrent and uh, refractory um, platinum refractory ovarian cancer third line and beyond recuperative had an approval for that that is also going to go so uh, our usage of PARP inhibitors is going to get better and lot more uh, directed in the next few uh, next next few years anything to say on this any of my colleagues here okay. uh, thank you all i i thank i th thank the organizers for this opportunity thank you also, there is something new called as Calictix and then folate dehydrogenase in ovary, which is very big way come. Please read that USFD had given an approval and uh, I am trying to start a trial on that. You give IV fluorescence, which is a dehydrase blocker and then based on that you do surgery and give those uh, medicines in platinum resistant refractory upfront, there was a survival benefit. It's a good paper. Thank you all the panelists, uh, Dr. Murli. Now our next next panel